Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Now let's talk about Deontay Wilder's victory by knockout, by right hand up top, over Luis Ortiz. Now to paraphrase Charles Dickens, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times, right? I personally thought for the second time that these guys fought each other that Luis Ortiz would beat Deontay Wilder. I'm not crying about it because the hedge held Wilder by KO, not a difficult hedge to think of when a guy has a greater than 95% KO percentage. Right? I also agree with the philosophy of former head football coach Jimmy Johnson. His team was leaving the field one day after crushing Notre Dame and he was asked why he ran up the score and Johnson's response to the effect was we're gonna play our game it's up to them to stop us right well let me just say Deontay Wilder is playing his game you know what it is right hand up top live and die by knockout it's up to the rest of the heavyweight division, his competition, to stop him. Let me just say this, though, right? No doubt Wilder is a Hall of Famer right now. I'm guessing some of you are cringing as I say that. The bottom line, though, is he, the next time he enters the ring, which will be against the lineal, he will have been heavyweight champion for five years. Understand, he's had ten title defenses. Only six men in history have had ten title defenses. Right? In the heavyweight division. Understand, his KO ratio, as I mentioned, is above 95%. We can look at his competition we can try to look for things to question the bottom line as he hopped in the ring with the lineal heavyweight champion and he did not lose officially he got a draw not only that you can imagine how this folklore is going to develop over the years right he knocked down Tyson Fury twice that second knockdown, people are going to question whether or not Tyson Fury beat the count. Whether or not the referee should have let that fight continue. I'm just telling you, there might never be a consensus on that point. Right? Never. Let me also say, too, Luis Ortiz, before the first fight, as he enters the ring against Deontay Wilder, Luis Ortiz was unbeaten. If you look at Luis Ortiz's amateur pedigree, if you look at his skill set, very crafty southpaw, those two fights against Wilder were difficult fights. Some, let me raise my hand here, didn't think Wilder had a chance in either fight. Wilder won both by stoppage. Let me also say, Dominique Brazil only had one loss when he entered the ring against Deontay Wilder. That one loss was to Anthony Joshua. Now, I was here before the Brazil-Joshua fight, laughing at the over-under, because the over-under was something really low, like three and a half rounds. I said, look, I know Joshua's been on a roll. Joshua was unbeaten at the time, but I said, this is a farce. Right? Brazil, after all, was an Olympian. Brazil was unbeaten. Three and a half rounds is an over-under that doesn't belong in a heavyweight title fight. Now, Brazil beat the over-under, right? He got it to the over. Gamblers who watched that video collect it. Well, Wilder didn't even allow Brazil to make it out of the first round. Right, understand, Wilder's on such a roll that these days, if you heard of a three and a half over under in a Wilder fight, given what he did to Bermain Stavern, the guy he beat for the title in the rematch, given what he did to Dominique Brazil, a lot of people are going to be hesitant there to take the over in a Wilder fight. 
Right? By the way, let me say, for the gamblers, a story of this fight was the over. <laughs> um, I didn't comment on it in the pre-fight video, but the over-under for this fight was six and a half rounds. Right? I know there are a group of you out there who took the over and who are just thankful right now that Ortiz made it something like a minute past the over. Well, let me just say this. I know on paper, a five-year brain um, has dropped every man he has faced in the ring. Right? 95% KO percentage, more than 40 wins, still has not lost. I know on paper, looking at the numbers, it's clear Wilder is a Hall of Famer. It's clear on paper this is one of the more impressive resumes we've come across. Not only that, you know, a heavyweight champion who wins by KO is special. You can't accuse Wilder of relying on judges, <laughs> right? This is a guy who, as we put it, takes matters into his own hands. All of that's true. And I know, and I am very grateful to all of my subscribers, but I know there's a group of subscribers that I have who, after every Wilder fight, especially when I've been hard on Wilder, will come out and will say, Dwyer, why are you criticizing Deontay Wilder? He was successful yet again. How could you argue with this level of success? Right? This last fight. Luis Ortiz doesn't make it to the eighth round. How could anyone argue with that? Some people here online were upset when I said I thought Tyson Fury won the fight. Right? The argument is simply, hey, Wilder knocks him down in two different rounds. Right? That's, you know, the Wilder side of the ledger is our guy is the one doing the heavy lifting. Right? I'll agree with that point. Wilder, even on my scorecard, is a future Hall of Famer. A five-year heavyweight championship reign where he doesn't dodge. He actually fights the lineal. He's going to fight the lineal again. Right? Where he gives the man who went the distance with him. Right? The first man to do so. Only two half. A rematch. Remains to Vern. And he destroys him in one round. Right? That's noteworthy. Many of the great champs in history were not champion as long as Deontay Wilder. What makes Wilder's reign even more impressive is Wilder wanted to have more fights. Right? He's on his way to fight Alexander Povetkin. That fight doesn't happen because Povetkin tests positive for Meldonia. Right? So as you look at the Wilder resume, you realize, hey, you know, this guy, this guy fights people. Whatever we think happened in the A.J. Wilder negotiations, right? The bottom line is Wilder publicly talked about fighting A.J. Wilder publicly backed himself into a corner saying he would fight A.J. in the United Kingdom. Right? Tyson Fury wanted to fight A.J. Deontay Wilder stepped up. For Tyson Fury. Right? Wilder doesn't come across to me as someone who's trying to avoid serious competition. But, and there's a but, and let's be clear here on it. Two of the three judges watching this fight, at the end of the sixth round, let's do the math, had Luis Ortiz up by four rounds. Now let's do the math here. How are you up by four rounds at the end of six? 
That's if you've only lost one round. That's if the card is 5-1. Right, 5-1. Two of the judges had Luis Ortiz up 5-1. I'm just telling you they were more generous than I was. Like Sky Boxing, I did not give Deontay Wilder a round in this fight. Let me say this too. At one point in the pre-fight, they showed a graphic. It was Lennox Lewis against Deontay Wilder, right? They were just, you know, speculating on what would happen if that fight, prime against prime, took place. Now, without thinking, and those are the true moments in life, I started laughing. It was comical to me. I thought, wow, people are really putting Deontay Wilder up against Lennox Lewis? It wasn't close. I view Wilder as a one-handed fighter. By the way, I still do, after watching this fight. Right, I view Wilder as a relief pitcher. Right, a guy with a good fastball. That's his straight right hand. He needs room to throw it. He doesn't move particularly well. Lennox Lewis, by contrast, was two-handed. Right? There are fights where Lennox Lewis is patient. There are also fights, and I encourage people to go back and look at Lewis against Andrew Galata. Galata is a guy who gave Riddick Bowe, another fighter who I think had more skills than Deontay Wilder. Galata gave Riddick Bowe all he could handle in two fights. When Lennox Lewis fought Galata and the fights here on YouTube, Lewis jumps on him. It's a two-handed attack. More importantly, you see Lewis's just speed much faster, much faster than Deontay Wilder's. Now, I know if you look at the numbers, people are going to say, hey, Wilder has not lost. Lewis was KO'd twice. Right? I'll concede that. There's no way to argue that Haseem Rockman doesn't KO Lewis the first time. No way to argue about it at all. Right? But just from my seat, if I'm going to judge a fighter by his skill set and how he uses his tools in the ring, let's just say, that there are a bunch of heavyweight champions who I feel have bigger toolkits than Deontay Wilder. Right, so I hear Wilder in interviews talk about how he would love to have fought Mike Tyson. Wow. Um, I understand Mike Tyson lost to Buster Douglas. No question about it. I understand Tyson had problems against some big guys who had some jabs. Tony Tucker has his moments against Mike Tyson. Point conceded. Right, Larry Holmes, to start their fight, looked good in those early rounds, very early rounds, against Mike Tyson. Right, but Tyson against Deontay Wilder. This is this Deontay Wilder with 10 consecutive title defenses. Right? I'm taking Mike Tyson. Let me say this, too. Years ago, I saw a young, promising champion on the way up. Right? He was young by heavyweight standards, and I'll agree, the heavyweight division ages more slowly than other divisions. Right? We'll call that Dwyer's Law of Relativity. I'll, I'll challenge Einstein here. Right? Time moves slower in the heavyweight division, in my opinion. Right? I have no scientific proof to back that up. Just my two eyes and years watching the sport. Now, years ago, there was an Olympic gold medalist who was an athlete at the time, who hit hard at the time, but who hadn't figured things out yet. And he hopped in the ring against Corey Sanders, a southpaw. 
like Luis Ortiz, and he got destroyed. Right? If you look at the film of Vladimir Klitschko against Corey Sanders, you'll see Klitschko leaning forward. You know, Klitschko actually wanting to trade with Sanders, who had a hellacious punch and a very high KO percentage. You'll notice that it's the challenger who's throwing left hands right down Main Street and who's stepping deep in the pocket. You'll notice that Vladimir Klitschko really didn't know how to defend himself was giving away his height, didn't have the skill set that we associate now with Vladimir Klitschko. After he lost that fight, had his big brother, Vitaly, tell him he needed to seriously consider leaving the sport. It was then that Vladimir Klitschko, and that wasn't his first loss, by the way. It was then that Vladimir Klitschko gets with Emmanuel Stewart who, of course, had been Lennox Lewis's trainer and literally retooled his career. That lean that Vladimir Klitschko has later where he's leaning back and throwing a jab, that's post Corey Sanders. right? Vladimir Klitschko, in his prime, had to relearn his game. Now, I know I'm sounding bitter. Trust me, I did not lose money on this fight. Wilder by KO held. Right? But I'm just a fan who appreciates brilliance, who appreciates creativity, who wants to see more skills than just the champion's fastball. Now, it's possible that Deontay Wilder, who did, Believe it or not, get up on his toes at times and outbox Bermain Stavern. That's how he wins the heavyweight title. Look at the scorecards. He outboxes Bermain Stavern by several rounds. It's possible that there's more to Deontay Wilder than meets the eye in his recent fights. It's possible that there's more to him than just cocking a right hand, keeping distance, getting his balance. Don't get me wrong, he does a lot of things. He does a lot of things very well. Right? Keeping that right hand cocked, keeping himself far away where the person's not jumping in on him, resetting his feet quickly whenever he has to back up, maintaining a wide stance. I think a stance is too wide, but the bottom line is he maintains it. Right? People move in on him, he jumps back, has his feet ready to throw that right hand. He does a lot of things very well. But the things he does, in my opinion, don't rise to the Vladimir Klitschko skill level. Right? They don't rise to the Vitaly Klitschko skill level. In his era, in his era, right now, they don't rise to the Tyson Fury skill level. What I want to do, and I know I'm going to get blowback on this, I do when I talk about Deontay Wilder fights. So what I want to do to Wilder Nation here is to challenge you to tell me the rounds when Wilder lands meaningful left hands in this fight. Right? I'm not talking about a good jab, right? One jab. Could you imagine looking at an Ali fight and saying, hey, name me the round when Ali lands a good jab, right? I'm not even I'm not talking about jabs. Does Wilder throw any hard punches, any good hooks that land on Luis Ortiz's body in this fight that almost makes it to the end of the seventh round? Folks, it's a rematch. Wilder should know Ortiz a little bit better. Ortiz is not a stranger. Right? Wilder has seen Ortiz for several rounds. Ortiz has to be memorable because Wilder, Ortiz is probably his toughest opponent in the ring. You know, Ortiz is the one opponent that had Wilder being examined by a doctor. He should be memorable. 
Why is Wilder's left hand so ineffective? When is the last time you saw a heavyweight champion? This one-handed. Let me say this. Ortiz fought a great fight. Now, I thought, let's say Wilder, we're viewing things from Wilder's perspective. I thought Ortiz would try to come in at 9.30 to 10.30, angle-wise. Right? Think of the hour hand. I thought Ortiz would pick a more severe angle than he picks. Ortiz is at about 11 o'clock relative to Wilder position-wise most of the fight. Right? Ortiz does some things brilliantly. Understand, Ortiz is, depending on your perspective, a little bit or perhaps more than a little bit older than Wilder. Ortiz keeps the fight at a slow pace. Right? He doesn't have the fight in some kind of frenzy that's going to deplete his stamina. He keeps the fight measured. Not only that, two guys are going for a knockout in the fight. Wilder is trying to load up on a straight right hand that he can barely throw because Ortiz moves just enough. And let's be clear here, Ortiz is savvy. He moves just enough. He's not moving like an Ali would move. He's not moving like a Larry Donald would move. Right? But yet his movement keeps Wilder's gun in the holster. Wilder can't throw that right hand that much. Meanwhile, Ortiz is trying to pivot Wilder into a straight left. Ortiz, in a measured fight, is going for the home run. Let me also say, he's just beating up Wilder, right? Wilder's not battered, but in terms of who's landing the more effective punches, who has the better jab, it's Ortiz by a mile. The fourth round, Ortiz lands three big shots, right? Three big shots. Ortiz is the one carrying the action in the fourth round. Ortiz is the one who, if you didn't know the fighters, and they said this is a rematch between the champ and a challenger he knocked down three times in the first match, you would have thought the champ was Luis Ortiz. Ortiz is the one who has springs in his legs. Right? Wilder's legs are stiff. He's a stiff-legged fighter. I can see it he's a Hall of Famer because results matter. Right? Results matter. But Wilder looks like a statue at times. Let me also say this too. Has anyone added it all up? You notice Wilder likes to throw that right hand up top. Wilder 6-7. He wants to make sure that the right hand that he throws up top finds its mark. So Wilder likes to fight taller fighters. Has anyone figured that out? Right? Luis Ortiz is 6'4". How tall was Dominique Brazil? How tall is Tyson Fury? When I hear Wilder talking about fighting Mike Tyson, does Wilder even know what that entails? Does Wilder think Tyson in a crouch is going to be there to eat a right hand thrown like this? So let me just put it this way. And I agree, there's, there's no question on the end of this fight. At the end of a seventh round that Luis Ortiz is winning, you'll notice the sequence at the end is interesting. Right? Ortiz is in the middle of the ring. Not Wilder. Ortiz is winning the round. It's the closing seconds of the round. Right? I think Ortiz at that point takes things for granted. And you can never do that against Deontay Wilder. That's Wilder's greatness. You have to be switched on for three minutes of every round. So Ortiz 
cavalierly when they're separated, puts himself between Wilder and the ropes. Right? Cavalierly, he doesn't have the space behind him. It's one of the few times in the fight that Ortiz puts himself between Wilder and the ropes. He concedes the middle of the ring to Wilder because it's the end of the round. It's at that point that Wilder has Ortiz with nowhere to go. Ortiz is a little lackadaisical. Wilder throws the punch he knew he was going to throw. Straight right hand up top. Hits Ortiz. Where else? Not in the body. It's not a body shot. Not in the arm. It's always a head shot, isn't it? Always a head shot. And this time Ortiz doesn't have his right hand up. Punch lands flush. That's the end of the match. Right? Deontay Wilder is a heavyweight champion. Also because Anthony Joshua has had a car crash with Andy Ruiz. And because Wilder shrewdly has signed to fight Tyson Fury for a rematch, whoever wins that AJ Ruiz fight is shut out for the next fight Wilder has. Right? There's the possibility too. Now I expect Ruiz to win that fight going away. I'll agree with those. I'll agree with Mike Tyson. I'll agree with Freddie Roach. There's a crowd out there that feels that Andy made a mistake losing all the weight for the rematch. Let me just say, too, that I don't think science fully appreciates it, but I'm just telling you, there's a correlation between the weight your body has, how, whether or not it's weight drained, and your punch resistance. I don't like the idea of a guy fighting in a rematch deciding voluntarily, hey, I took the other guy's punches the first time. Keep in mind that first fight, Andy's on the canvas. Right? Had Andy been just a little bit more hurt, AJ would have defended the title. That first fight would have been unremarkable. Andy gets off the canvas, gets hit with the right hand. Right? I'm a little bit nervous that the lower weight might actually impact his ability to take shots like that in a rematch. But of course, he's not the only one losing weight for the rematch, is he? Joshua's losing weight for the rematch. If Joshua thinks he's going to be able to beat Andy Ruiz on his back foot, he's kidding himself. Well, let me just say this. There's a big difference. It's huge. Between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, right? It's, it's huge. Wilder's a fastball pitcher. You know his the, the biggest tool in his toolbox. Right? You know it's a straight right hand. You don't know the biggest tool in Tyson Fury's toolbox. Because Tyson Fury's not a relief pitcher, he's a starting pitcher. Right? Tyson Fury was a shell of himself when he came back, fought two guys in witness protection, and then fought Deontay Wilder. He's a shell of himself. Prime Tyson Fury can fight 12 rounds left-handed. All of the problems that Luis Ortiz as a southpaw just gave Wilder Fury can do all of those problems. Let me also say, speaking of Freddie Roach, and I know Fury has a young trainer who's popular. Okay, whatever. Look, there was one guy in Freddie in Tyson Fury's corner that first fight against Deontay Wilder, who I thought gave him spectacular advice. That was Freddie Roach. At one point, Freddie Roach wanted Fury to come inside on Wilder. Folks, Wilder needs space to throw that right hand. I'm just telling you, I saw Bernard Hopkins throughout his career smother a guy's dominant hand when that guy needed space to throw it. Right? If you look at Wilder, the people in history who would give him a hard time, right? On the left side, Luis Ortiz will always give. 
while they're a hard time. I believe someone who can operate and move to Wilder's left side. I still believe the angle is 930 to 1030. But if you want to be at 11 o'clock, that's fine if you know how to move. A person who can roll away from Wilder's right hand. A person who's a southpaw simply because Wilder can't counter the person's jab like he wants would take away a lot of Wilder's ability to box. If that fighter knows what they're doing, they should sweep or come close to sweeping. The slow rounds. Right? On the right side, Wilder's power hand. I believe a Joe Fraser has the style to beat Deontay Wilder. We're just talking about styles now. Joe Fraser bobbed and weaved. Joe's head was rarely stationary. Joe would bob and weave his way in. You need a guy who can come in on Wilder's right side, smother Wilder's right hand, and have a left hook to hurt Wilder when he comes inside if you're going to operate on the right side, up close. I believe Joe Fraser's game would clobber Deontay Wilder, right? We're coming out of an era of tall, oversized heavyweights, six four and up, right? Big man. Charles Martin, AJ, Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury, right? The guys are tall. They're big. Lucas Brown, they're big men. Right? We've gotten away from the Tyson, Joe Fraser, Marciano, part of boxing, Jack Dempsey. Right? I'm just telling you, I'm looking at Deontay Wilder. He's a sign of the times. Right? He wants to throw a right hand horizontal that'll take out another big man up top. He needs a guy who doesn't move his head that much. Right? The head's there to be hit. I don't think he'd know what to do with the Ken Norton. Right? A guy who has his head hidden behind his glove and stuff like that. I think an Archie Moore would give him problems. Archie certainly would get inside. Would try to smother this long right hand. Why seed all the space? Why well, see all the space to Wilder? Let me say this too. A big man like Tyson Fury. First fight, Fury's outside. He's operating behind a jab and a lot of feints. His volume is not what it should have been. It should have been higher. But he's still winning rounds. Understand, as long as Fury is moving, Deontay Wilder is ineffective. Right? We want to remember the two knockdowns. The first knockdown doesn't come until the ninth round. This is a guy in his third fight back from rehab. How is a guy not long removed from rehab after two unremarkable fights able to be in the ring outboxing a multi-year reigning heavyweight champion for the first eight rounds? So I'll just put it diplomatically here. I concede. I have to. Either the results matter or they don't. The results matter. I concede with the greater than 95% KO ratio. Right? With wins over mandatory contenders as well as a lineal heavyweight champion. Right? With a record that has him dropping everyone he's faced. Right? Tyson Fury gets back up, makes it to the end of the fight. Remains to Vern, stays on his feet the first fight, gets dropped the second fight. Right? With that record, with a five-year reign as heavyweight champion, it'll be five years when he enters the ring against Tyson Fury for the rematch. Even a critic like me concedes Deontay Wilder is a future Hall of Famer. 
right? If you were 14 at the start of his reign, he has taken you to 19, right? You remember him. Those are the champs that stay in your memory. It's that group, years from now, that's going to vote on his Hall of Fame candidacy. Right? Power is the last to go. I suspect Wilder is going to keep his power at least through his 30s. How old was Vladimir Klitschko when he dropped AJ? Right? At least through his 30s. That right hand is always going to be a bazooka. I concede he's a Hall of Famer. But wow, in terms of artistry, in terms of the size of his toolkit, I just, I, I just don't know how I can put him in the same sentence with a Tyson, right, folks? Tyson not only had a left hand; he he stopped guys with his left hand. Understand, Tyson, in addition to throwing hooks, threw a hell of an uppercut. You want to see a Tyson fight where he just crushes a guy's body? Look at later Tyson, not even prime Tyson, later Tyson against Brian Nielsen. To the Wilder crowd, tell me the fight where he beats a guy with body shots. Please, there's an entire comment section here. Go ahead and tell me that fight. Right? I know the Wilder crowd's so desperate to get away from Wilder's right hand that many of you have written me and have said, hey, Look at the left hook he throws against Bermain Stavern. Folks, I would argue that if you break down that Stavern film, it's his right hand up top. Where else? That does most of the damage. Right? So, if we're lucky, if we're lucky in this phone call that I'm ignoring isn't a major call, if we're lucky, and if Wilder continues to improve his game, like Vladimir Klitschko did after getting destroyed by Corey Sanders, who he never gives a rematch to. Understand, Big Brother had to step in for him to take care of Corey Sanders. Right? If Wilder continues to improve, then maybe he'll reach a point where in his later 30s, critics like me will say, you know what, he belongs in the paragraph with a Lennox Lewis. Right? A Vitaly Klitschko. Right? That time isn't right now. He's knocking guys out with the one hammer in his toolkit. He's not an accomplished body puncher. I don't see him throwing a lot of punches other than that right hand. Right? Defensively, he gets hit with some shots in this Ortiz fight. Right? Defensively, he's not great. Right? Let's just say his fights are predictable. I congratulate those of you who's, who have ridden his wave and have made a lot of money betting on his fights. I'm just telling you, not only do I expect Tyson Fury, who struggled against Otto Wallen, let's be real here, not only do I expect Tyson Fury to destroy him, I'm hoping Tyson Fury has some Andre Ward in him. Andre Ward's fighting Mikel Kessler, decides he's going to come inside. In fact, a better Andre Ward fight. He's fighting Edison Miranda. It seemed Andre was bored in that fight. Andre decided, okay, I've moved enough. Let me come inside and see what this guy's going to do deep in the pocket. Right? I want to see a big man come in, get Wilder on his back foot. Chris Ariola did. Right? Actually test Wilder's ability to take shots. You know what? He's badly hurt the Eric Molina fight, folks. Revisit that fight. Just like he was badly hurt, he says buzzed, in the first Luis Ortiz fight. Right? Wilder needs to get tested. I want to see a Tyson Fury, even if he's winning rounds dancing away, 
say, you know what, I don't think this guy can handle my inside game. Fury gets badly cut by Otto Wallen. The ref should have stopped that fight. Fury should not have his heavyweight title to me. But interestingly enough, Fury decides after the cut, I've got to get close to this young kid. I can't allow him to hit me in this eye again. So then Fury shows you why he's the better fighter. He puts that cut up on Volley. He goes inside. 6'9 becomes an inside fighter. He has that gear. Force Wilder to show us whether he has that gear. Until I see that, until I see more than just hints of a left hand, until I actually see a left hand, until I see punches put together, not a one-punch knockout, but a guy setting up the knockout, moving the other fighter in place with strategic shots, Tony Bellew against David Hay, the rematch, which is actually better than the first fight. Until I see that from Deontay Wilder, then I'm going to laugh at suggestions of him in the ring with either the lion Lennox Lewis or Iron Mike Tyson. As it is, as it is, I blame Tyson Fury for lingering too close to Wilder in the 12th round. Right? If Fury doesn't get dropped in that 12th round, the narrative we're having here would be entirely different. Right? I'll concede. I'll be up here wiping the egg off my face. If Wilder beats Fury a second time. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments, including points of disagreement including fights, you believe, where Wilder shows he has a hellacious left hand. Fights, you believe, in which Wilder <laughs> wins off body shots. Right? I hope you leave that information in the comment section of this video. Congratulations to Wilder. You're certainly a Hall of Famer. You still have skeptics. That's how I see it. Thanks for stopping by.